you have a seat. There's only one who can take a broken heart and make it whole again. Only one who can take our life messed up and dirty and make it clean. His name is Jesus. He's here. And we've been on a journey here at First Baptist learning about him. And just reading through the Gospel of Mark, meeting the Jesus we never knew. And today, we're at a place, just naturally as the text flows and as we've moved through it, where he heals a man, but more importantly, he tells him, your sins are forgiven. There's only one who can forgive sin and cause the lame to walk. His name is Jesus. And I want you to turn to Mark chapter 2 and meet him. He's in a house. He's in Capernaum, which is in the Sea of Galilee region. And he's probably with Simon Peter. That was most likely Simon Peter's house. And last week we looked at the first part of this story, which let me just tell it to you. There's a paralytic, and he has four friends, and they want to get their friend to Jesus. Why? Because they believe Jesus can change his life. Jesus can heal him. So they're trying to get their friend to Jesus. They go to the door. There's no way to get in the house. And so all of a sudden, they do the unthinkable. They go up on the roof. And everybody inside all of a sudden hears something on the roof. And it was not Santa and his reindeers. All of a sudden, the roof opens. And they see a man being let down on a mat. And as this man is being let down, Jesus stops. And what Jesus says in verse 5 is, Son, your sins are forgiven. And at that moment, there were people there who were angry. They were so upset with Jesus. How could he claim to forgive sin? So watch what happens with Jesus that moment. In verse 6, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk, but that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin? He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed, and he went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, and may the Lord do it again, right here, in this city. You see, that moment was loaded with significance. I think this may be one of the most important miracles that Jesus ever did. Because he made a proclamation that you just don't make. Only God could make it, but Jesus said it. And what set it up was, when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, all of a sudden, there was, this, there was this anger, and Jesus knew it. So he said, okay, which is easier to say? Is it easier for me to say to this man, hey, your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier for me to say to him, take up your mat and walk? Now, the answer is, it's easier to say your sin's forgiven. And the reason is, nobody knows. If you say your sin's forgiven, how does anybody know if they are? But if you say get up and walk and the man can't walk, then there's the problem. So what does Jesus do? He looks at him and it says, So that you all may know that I have the power to forgive sin, I say to you, take your mat and walk. And he did. And everybody was shocked. And they said, we've never seen anything like this. In that story, just three simple truths. One, every church has a roof. Every church has a roof. We talked about it last week. The roof represents the limit of how far a church will go to bring people in. Oh, yeah, we'll bring some people, but not, people not like us, we don't want them in here. Can I just tell you what we have decided at First Baptist Orlando? We will tear off every rooftop there is to bring the city of Orlando to Jesus Christ. There is no roof. 
If it exists, it exists individually, but together, corporately, we've made a commitment. We exist in this city to help this city, to bless this city, and to pray for this city, and to be there when this city needs us, which is now. So every church has a rooftop. Every person has a mat. Every one of us walked in the same way that guy came that day. We're cripples. You know why? The Bible says we've all sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not a righteous person here. If you have to be perfect to be in this church, you don't have a pastor. And, and, and we don't have a membership. And the only ones who are left, you don't want to be with them. So I, just the way it is, right? We're all messed up. In fact, the Bible says that the righteousness, our righteousness, if you were to add up all the good things and all the good things about us in this room, pile it up in the middle of this room, it would be like filthy rags before God. You say, well, how is that? Why is that? Because it's the reality we live with. We're all crippled. We all came in with a mat. And that mat represents something that's holding us back, something that's broken in our life. It may be a broken place nobody sees. It may be a relationship from when you were a child that's never been healed. It may be a marriage that's falling apart and, and, and you feel like you're in a prison in that marriage. It may be a work situation, maybe financial. It could be health. I mean, it could be something you're battling. There are people in this room that are battling cancer. We all have a mat. Every person has a mat. But the last thing, and you can't miss this, is every person can be changed by Jesus Christ. Every person can be changed by Jesus Christ. And that's the moment when Jesus says to them, which is easier? And then he looks and says, get up, take your mat, and go. The greatest miracle in this story is not that that man walked. The greatest miracle in this story is that his sins were forgiven. You see... Your sins being forgiven, my sins being forgiven, is where it all starts. Jesus didn't come to heal just the physical body. He came to hear, heal the soul of a man. He came to start in here what's broken, what's not right. And it all goes back to the day, Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, how Adam and Eve, when they sinned against God, then there was this broken relationship with the Creator. Remember, they hid from Him. And so all of us live with that sense of brokenness, and we're separated from God. And so what did Jesus come to do? He came to remove that. Because he knew if we were ever going to be what we were created to be, it had to start in here. And so Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, meaning you're healed here. And that healing inside has a way of working itself out. But it starts in here. Man wants to start on the outside. Man wants to clean us up on the outside. I got a text this morning from a friend of mine. He said, man, I would be there today, but I, my life is, I need to clean up my life. <clears throat> I didn't text him back immediately. I just thought to myself, oh, please, you can't clean your life up. You can't fix your life. You come to Jesus, he starts in here, and he cleans it from the inside out, which is a beautiful picture of what this miracle is about. Your sins are forgiven. It's one of the greatest declarations ever. It meant that he had to go to a cross, and he had to hang on a cross, not for his sin. He was perfect, but for yours and for mine. And in so doing, he removed that separation. So now we can be whole starting inside. Let me tell you what the best thing, the, the, the way that I describe that. That is like your debt being gone. It's like this sense of, and, and people still have it, I feel unworthy to be in church. I feel unworthy. I feel like God's just looking down in anger. And we feel that about ourselves. We can't imagine God welcoming us. We can't imagine what we saw in Adam's dance, that we're clean. But you see, God says you are. God removes the debt. How many of you owe somebody something? Raise your hand. You owe somebody something. Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hand, I'd like to visit with you. I mean, are you Dave Ramsey? I mean, who are you? I, how, do you how do you not live in this world and not owe somebody something, right? Think about the biggest debt you got. What's the biggest debt you have? Maybe your house, car, Student loans, hospital bill, the biggest debt you have. Think about it. What if you go home after church 
and somebody's standing outside where you park, and they say, hey, got some good news for you. Your debt's gone. What, what if that happened? What if you go home and somebody looked at you and said, the debt is gone? What would you do? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Sit there looking at me like you're all religious. No, you wouldn't be acting like that. You'd be up dancing and jumping and turning flips. That's what we feel like when a debt's been taken, right? When debt's gone. That's what we ought to feel. Except the debt is so much bigger than a house, car, student loan, or whatever. It's spiritual debt. It's gone. And the way it happens is you trust in Him. You believe in Him. You come. The Bible says, whoever calls on Him shall be saved. I just think it's the greatest miracle of all. Then, that is the beginning. And then he says, take up your mat and walk. You see, once he heals your soul, it's amazing what he can do for your relationships. It's amazing what he can do for the world around you, your family, and even physically. I'm going to share something. This week, God really spoke to me about this. I believe every healing, every healing that he gives us is because of his ability to forgive our sin. Let me explain that. Where does sickness come from? What is the ultimate source of sickness? What is it? It's sin. But it, not necessarily ours. If anybody ever looks at you and says, well, you're sick because you've got sin in your life. Hey, that's not the case. There are many, many examples of people having illness that did not commit a sin caused it it was simply a result of what when Adam and Eve fell it messed up everything it broke everything and so when you read Genesis and you read Genesis 3 you realize that there's a curse and that curse I mean all the things we're dealing with with tornadoes and hurricanes and and, and a world that's falling apart that's a part of what happened it's the brokenness that sin brought to this world so what did Jesus do he went to a cross so that he could reverse the curse. So now Isaiah says, by his stripes we are healed. You realize that? By the death of Jesus, healing is now possible. Because of what he did on the cross, healing physically is now possible. So if you ever are healed from any disease, you ought to thank Jesus for the cross and for the stripes that Jesus bore. And only he can do that. So he says to the man, take up your mat and walk. And guess what? The very thing that carried the man, the man carried out. The very thing that once owned him, now he owns it. The very thing that has defeated you, frustrated you, has absolutely imprisoned you in the name of Jesus today, I believe you can get up and walk out of here and be changed in the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what he came to do. So what is the mat in your life? What is it today that you would love for him to set you free from? Well, it all starts with the first one. Have your sins been forgiven? Do you know for sure that Jesus Christ is Lord in your life? And that is the first and greatest of all miracles. Then, when you know him, as your Savior and Lord, it's amazing how that changes everything else. So today, my prayer for the families, my prayer for these who survived, is that you would know a healing that we can't know. We weren't there. We didn't experience the loss you have. But Jesus knows. And my prayer is that you will find him healing your broken heart. And should any of you need to know the forgiveness of sin, Jesus is there for you to heal you from the inside out. And today could be the beginning of that for all of us. We're here to pray for a city's healing. We're here to pray that God would take a city and somehow bring good. Listen, I know the legacy will go on. I know there will be testimony after testimony. Right down here on the front, and I don't mean to embarrass her, but the most beautiful little girl right there that I met just a minute ago. You know what her name is? That little girl's name is Amanda. Because she was named for one of the victims 
of the pole shooting. It's her best friend sitting here, the mom. And I thought to myself, what a beautiful legacy. What a beautiful namesake. I believe God is going to bring good and he's going to do things through this weekend and beyond. But it may all start today in the presence of Jesus Christ. So you know what I pray this weekend? You know how they said that day, we've never seen anything like this? I pray that the world will watch Orlando. And the world will say, we've never seen anything like this. And I pray that for the glory of God. We've never seen anything like that. So I want you to bow with me. As our heads are bowed, I want you to bow your heads. I'm going to ask you just in the next few moments, we're going to sing. The altar is here. You want to pray for your city? Come. You want to pray for these families? Come. You want to talk to somebody about the forgiveness of sin? Come. Whatever it is, come to the altar. Jesus calls. The words of the song we're going to sing just basically talks about how we're broken. And he wants us to come. Are you hurting? Are you broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Father, in this moment, thank you for being here, Jesus. Thank you for being here, one who can forgive sin and can heal our body. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.